Welcome everybody. This is Julian from Straight From a Scientist. I'm here with Connor. We are going to do a roundtable episode today on CTE and traumatic brain injury, and specifically related to sports. I've been doing a lot of reading and currently writing a literature review on this topic. And yeah, there's been a lot of good science about it coming out. So we're going to talk to you guys, give you guys an introduction on what it even is and yeah, and all that. So glad to have you on, Connor. How are you doing today? Not too bad this morning. So I just want to clarify, CTE is chromatic or sorry, chronic <laughs> traumatic chronic. encephalopathy, right? It's a, exactly. it's quite, it's, quite a mouthful. It's, it's a mouthful, so we just say CTE. <laughs> it's way, it's way right. easier. <laughs> and actually, so, so yeah, we will. I, when you hear CTE or TBI, those will be related to chronic traumatic encephalopathy, encephalopathy. What you know? What, encephalopathy. I'm not, yeah, encephalopathy. That's, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> Try and say that even three times fast. Yep. No, nah, I'm okay. <laughs> so, uh, and then traumatic brain injury would be TBI. So we will we'll probably will be using those acronyms a lot to make it smoother. And because we're not very good at pronouncing it. <laughs> Is there a real difference between TBI and CTE? So that's actually an excellent place to start, Connor. Um, so TBI we is more of an acute injury. So TBI would be you're playing football and you get smashed by you know linemen and you get a concussion get knocked out then you have a chance a pretty high chance um, to have to get an acute brain injury so this would be a tbi event now the cte would be over the course of 10 seasons you get a thousand of these small tbis and it's going to lead to what cte is or what we know what we think we know about cte which is we're classifying it now as a neurodegenerative disease that is, you know, very similar to Alzheimer's um, and Parkinson's disease in its symptomology. It's kind of like a mix of the both, both of them. Um, but it's related to these repetitive subconcussive and concussive injuries, so these TBIs, over the course uh, of many years. So that's the okay. difference. So CTE is just chronic TBI. Basically, it. Yes and no. So it you know TB not all TBI will lead to CTE, but sometimes, but CTE is always caused by TBI. Does okay, makes sense. Yeah, uh, not all <coughs> squares so, or rectangles. Yeah, so maybe or, you sorry, get not all rectangles. <laughs> <laughs> don't listen. Don't, to get, me. don't get confused with geometry. That's too confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so. Too much so TBI. basically, yeah, basically how it works. I mean, we don't really know what the risk factors are. I mean, we know the risk factor is a TBI. You know, if you get repetitive TBI, you have a chance of getting CTE. But we don't know what the number is, and the number could change between each individual. You know, maybe mm -hmm. it depends. And these things are, it depends on many, many factors. So something crazy like how strong your neck muscles are and have an effect on how a TBI or the your chance of getting a TBI. So if you have mm. an impact and you have really strong neck muscles, they're going to absorb a lot of the impact and you're not actually going to get a brain you know, an acute brain injury. So there's a lot of factors and you know it's really hard to measure all these factors and to, you know, especially with CTE being such a chronic long-term thing mm. that it's hard to measure it and hard to you know, say x equals you know it's caused by tbi after 10 tbis you're gonna have ct you know it's really hard to tell right. so you know it's similar to alzheimer's right we have risk factors but we cannot be definitive in that you will get alzheimer's say so, well you probably shouldn't i don't know you know more about alzheimer's than i do <laughs> so that was going to be a question um from me to you is that this does sound a lot like Alzheimer's, right? In Alzheimer's disease, we have protein clumps. Um, tau is the primary agent that is thought to kill cells. And in CTE, it's, it's tau suspected as well, right? So I guess my question is, what in terms of diagnoses do doctors use to determine whether it's CTE or Alzheimer's, or are they really one in the same? Because I do know that traumatic brain injury can increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease by a massive margin. I don't know the exact figures, but um, anyone who is exposed to 
brain injury, um, even early on in life, can suffer a lot of detrimental effects later in life via Alzheimer's-like symptoms. Um, so that sounds a little, kind of a lot like CTE. I guess CTE may be more cut and dry in that it's repetitive. It's very chronic. So am I, am I along the right lines? Or what is the differential diagnosis there? What do doctors actually use to determine that? Yeah, and this is an excellent question. Um, and obviously, so first off, if you have a patient that is, you know, we can get into clinical features and symptoms about, you know, this a little bit later, but you're asking more about pathological um, hallmarks, I guess, right? You want to know pathologically yeah, I guess the difference? How, how so, does a doctor determine this person has or had CTE versus this person has or had Alzheimer's disease? What's yeah, so a lot of that is going to be, well, look, here we have an NFL football player who's starting to have symptomology you know, 15 years after retiring. So based on that, we already know he's had X amount of concussions and you know, thousands of impacts, subconcussive impacts that we don't know exactly what have happened during those subconcussive impacts. Um, so that's the first, you know, telltale sign. We say, okay, what is his history? Is he a boxer? What is his, what has he been doing his life, you know? <laughs> Um, the second is that they actually, the difference, the main difference pathologically between Alzheimer's and CT is, you know, first off Alzheimer's in my, I'm not sure you, you know, this better than I do, but has more amyloid than tau. Is that correct? There's a, a higher quantity of amyloid. Depends on, well, it depends on the stage. So there are actually some people with high deposit, high amounts of amyloid deposits. So amyloid beta, um, again, if anyone wants to know more about amyloid beta, we did a great episode with all science. Uh, the editor of All Science, Maya Gastilla. That's episode 13. Um, but amyloid beta can show up in the brain of healthy patients too. So amyloid beta isn't necessarily linked to pathological deficits or deficits in memory and learning. Tau, however, is tightly linked to neuronal loss. So if you have a lot of tau in the cere cerebrospinal fluid, you're much more likely to have cognitive deficits. So that you're right, both of those show up in Alzheimer's disease. Um, amyloid beta is thought to show up early in the disease and then somehow trigger the formation of really nasty species, really nasty forms like misfolded, messed up forms of tau that eventually cause damage. Mm -hmm. So in CTE, does it go straight to tau? There's no amyloid. So in CTE, it's, it's different. You know, the main, the main hallmark is tau and okay. amyloid, amyloid is only in about 50% of the cases. So you're not seeing amyloid in all the cases. Um, and I think mm -hmm. also there's an earlier onset. Alzheimer's, normally the onset is, is late, right? I mean, between 60s and 80s, right? Yeah, the exactly risk sure. really multiplies um, once you hit your 80s. Exactly. So and in CT, you're going to get an earlier onset. Maybe it's 40s, 50s, depending on obviously, you know, it's so different between each case because it depends on how many TBIs you had. I mean, it depends on so many factors. Mm -hmm. That there's not, you know, one age where it starts. But normally it's, you know, 10, 15 years after you retire from, you know, heavy, heavy high contact sports, um, boxers oh, okay. and, and things like that. So, so anyway, it's still progressive. Yeah, it's progressive. Yeah, and it just keeps getting worse. So here's the thing. So basically the main difference is that in Alzheimer's, you have these tau aggregates, right? And these are mm -hmm. found in... Oof, well, they're found in the neurons mainly, but they're found in like the soma, the cell body, and then the dendrites, which they're not supposed to be there. They're supposed mm -hmm. to be in the axon, which is like the outgoing tail of a neuron. So in my understanding, it depends on the, the layer of where these aggregates are found. In CTE, the, this aggregates are found in the outer layers, two and three, mm. whereas oh. a, in AD, they're found in layers three and five from my understanding yeah um, and in alzheimer's disease tau is thought to start deep inside of the brain and then it spreads we now know that it can spread it's pretty scary throughout the brain and it spreads outwards so it sounds like mm -hmm. in ct it's starting yeah, outwards CT is because different. you're getting the, the damage there right exactly so this the structure of the tau is the, basically the same but in ct you're gonna have a different pattern of distribution and, and what they do to see this is they use these PET scans, this is very new, um, mm -hmm. 
they're using these radio nucleotide PET scans that bind to um, all these things, amyloid and tau and all this, and you can get a visual image of where it is bound to, right? Mm -hmm. So that's now, positron emission <coughs> tomography, if I'm not mistaken, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. So I just want to visual, help people visualize that. Um, we can definitely put some stuff up in the show notes on this. Uh, it's essentially a tracer, so it's like exactly uh, like a little tag that you can put on, and it, it'll find these proteins. Exactly. So they they drink some sort of you know it's like a contrast almost, but it's radioactive, mm -hmm. and it's going to bind. I don't know how maybe after ten minutes or twenty minutes, whatever it is to all these you know, aggregates in the brain. And then you do the PET scan, the PET scan, um, and you will be able to see where it's bound to. And that is one way to diagnose. Uh, but it, I mean, this is all recent. This is all in the past couple of years. So these, it is these really have, exciting, not, though. have not been validated. You know, it's, it's being used for research purposes, but not really clinically to say you have CTE. You know, so maybe they know, I don't know exactly where it's at right now. But I know that they have recently started using this. And actually, recently, they have confirmed it post-mortem, which is huge, especially, mm -hmm. I, you know about this. Um, once you confirm it post-mortem, that's, that's a big step. So they did this PET scan with the radionucleotide. Um, and then they found, then, then the patient died, and they did a post-mortem, you, know, um, you know, histochemistry. Right. And they found that, sure enough, what they saw in the PET scan was what they saw in the chemistry. So that's really cool. Yeah, it's really um, reassuring. They validated. They basically double-checked themselves. So exactly. it's working so, then. Yeah, because yeah. they're using PET scans in Alzheimer's disease as well. So there are a lot of similarities there, for sure. Exactly. So similar, yeah, the main differences, I guess, would be that there's the main, you know, hallmark is tau. Amyloid, mm -hmm. you know, 50% of the cases, not all of them. And the question is, what of those cases? I mean, I'm sure some of these cases get mistaken for Alzheimer's, you know, or Alzheimer's versa. gets exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, as these numbers are not perfect, I'm sure they're just numbers that we found and, you know, we're not really sure. Also, so uh, my yeah. next question, though, is does that even matter? Uh, mm. Because, <laughs> like, what are the treatments for CTE versus Alzheimer's disease, like AD? Are there yeah. any differences? And I mean, does it even, should we just be treating everyone the same? Well, the question is, are there any treatments, period, right? Anything. No, I don't think we have anything. You know, what we do have is what, acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and things like that. Right. Well, we can which, up the levels of acetylcholine in Alzheimer's disease patient. It does help. I mean, it's been shown to help. Um, we can also block the activity of glutamate receptors. So essentially it... It now that's what kind of calms Mamantina, the brain down. Yeah, Mamantine, yeah, yeah that's Mamantine. right. I was saying Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mamantino. But, yeah, so, the, but, you know, these are what, marginal improvements? At so, best, yeah. yeah I mean, best. we're working on other other treatments for sure, but. Well, so, yeah, for right now, the problem is that there's no really in vivo testing, um, and this PET radionucleotide is pretty pretty advanced and promising but the problem is that it's it's complicated you know how many mm -hmm. hospitals do you know have access to these pet radionucleotide testing you know and it's validated the machines yeah, yeah the so machines it, that it, run them are ridiculously expensive right it gets complicated yeah it gets really complicated and then he's like well what if i i know but then what do i do i give them this drug that helps them you know two percent for a year and then it's drops off you know so that's the question is mm -hmm. Is it worth all this money? I mean, there's still a lot of research needs to be done in this aspect. Um, so, anyway, what else? Um, yeah, so actually what they've been doing recently, I wanted to get into serum biomarkers because this is huge. What they, what recently, actually, I think it was last year, 2017, they up, they released a serum biomarker, a blood test, for concussions you know this was huge i read it all over the internet right yep. and but here's the thing you know and they claim that it you know measures they claim that it was a big step for ct and it is and it isn't you know because first off this blood test is going to measure um i think the the the, um, the proteins were uchl1 i don't know if you know anything about this no idea and then <laughs> G, GFAP, 
which is glio G-fab. yeah G-fab. it's a marker of astrocytes and radio glial cells which are like neural stem cells in the brain exactly but so the 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 idea behind this was that after a traumatic brain injury some of these proteins are going to break off and get released into the bloodstream and you can measure the amount of these proteins in the blood saying okay there was some brain damage here or there wasn't brain damage okay mm-hmm. and that's gfap and uchl1 that's fascinating which is, actually so which astrocytes connected. which have a ton of gfap in them exactly um, we stain for gfap when we're looking for astrocytes sometimes uh, they can form scars around damaged tissue exactly so, so- well, this we saw in a, in a lot of boxers. You'll see a lot of um, yeah. scars in the astroglial star, scarring, and that's a that's another sign. But that's more boxers. Um, and so mm. UCHL1 is connected to the neural cell body injury, neuronal cell oh. body injury. Excuse okay. me. Okay. And the GFAP is going to be more like you said, astroglial injury. So from that, we we can see okay, someone you know got smashed or got knocked out and. No. So instead of, you know, to be honest, this is not even a concussion test. It's a test to see if there's injury in the brain. You know, whether you're concussed or not, you can take this blood test and to see. You know, has not, you know, that's the other problem that we see is that concussion is not directly related to the amount of damage that's happening. Oh, so they're finding that's that weird. sub Yeah, it is, you know, it doesn't make sense. You would think that someone getting concussed is going to have more damage than someone not getting it cuz but that's not really the fact you know so anyway oh, so I, I don't even know then the, like the ideology <laughs> of concussions <laughs> i have to rethink everything yeah so concussions from my understanding is your brain is hitting the 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 walls of your mm-hmm. skull and it's you know kind of producing like an automatic shutdown mechanism right but oh i see so it's compensatory effect to limit damage perhaps yeah i think it's to limit damage because your your brain hits the side of the skull and it kind of was like okay i need to shut down this something traumatic is happening Mm -hmm. um and actually if we want to speak more about you know mechanism of injury boxing is the x is an excellent example excellent metaphor so concussions this is something really interesting for me you know i love boxing and i love contact sports it's one of my favorite things to watch but uh, also studying this i kind of at the same time i'm like oh shit yeah you you get really worried for the people you're watching yeah yeah but you know it's still a beautiful for me it's the most beautiful and pure sport you know man-to-man combat you know as brutal as it is it's still you know the most real human form of competition you know i think it's pure well, because uh, all sports are simulated war anyways. Exactly. So if you get to the base of what it is, then yes, we're just watching war. <laughs> exactly. But that being said, I've also done extensive studying and research on, you know, the mechanisms of injury, and it's kind of can be hard to watch. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that being said, so if, you're, if you like boxing and if you know anything about it, a jab, which is like a straight punch, right? This is just mm-hmm. straight straight punch a straight hand or a jab is kind not quick yeah it's, it's not going to produce a lot of damage and compare when you're comparing it to a twisting so like a uppercut or a, a hook like so a these, haymaker yeah well a haymaker can be a jab or it can be a straight a straight hand okay. a hook is when the the head is twisting so you're actually twisting the brain stem which as i'm sure you know that just doesn't sound good. <laughs> yeah. No, nope, not really. Yeah. So <laughs> twisting the but yeah, when you do a hook or an uppercut, you're gonna be twisting the brainstem, which is gonna cause more injury and mm. um higher likelihood of being concussed or of getting knocked out and becoming unconscious. Mm-hmm. So it depends also on the mechanism of action. So the the other problem with CTE is that depending on what sport you played or what history you have. Uh, depends on a lot on what symptoms you might have and even what aggregates are building up in your brain so that being said um, line you know football players which is huge they have more linear impacts right they're gonna you know more they're going straight forward you know Mm -hmm. into somebody else so whereas boxers 
you know, you want to give a hook or an uppercut so you can knock them out, right? So you're getting more twisting forces, right? I see. So that being said, yeah, so it's different actually. And a lot of boxers have more motor-like symptoms in CTE, which is closely related to Parkinson's as far as some of the symptoms that we see. And so didn't, football, um, yeah, was it me. Muhammad Ali got Parkinson's in the end, right? Yeah, so exactly. So I would him. love to, you know, do a radionucleotide PET scan on his brain and to see, you know, Too what exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, it would be very interesting to see exactly, you know, we, we classified it as Parkinson's and maybe it was Parkinson's, you know, we don't know. And maybe mm. it was connected to his you know, career in boxing. Maybe it wasn't, you know, so this is questions we don't really know. Um, but so, it's true that boxers have more motor like symptoms, whereas football players, it's been associated with more neuropsychiatrical system, you know, um, like depression and aggression and like mm -hmm. that interesting so i know in parkinson's disease it's not tau so much as alpha synuclein that mm -hmm. aggregates is that the same in these two types of chromatic or chromatic i always say chronic traumatic encephalopathy and i'm gonna stop that CTE. just say ct <laughs> i can't say that. i always say ct just because i'm afraid yeah. to say it so it, is there <laughs> is there delineation between so you have tau building up and clumping and alpha synuclein in two types of ct based off of boxers versus yeah NFL so players? you would think so right you would think um that it would be different but actually i don't know and give me one second the the difference is not related to uh, alpha synuclein. It's more related to TDP forty three. I don't know if you anything know anything about uh, that. Oh yeah, so that's a protein that aggregates in yeah, amyotrophic exactly. lateral sclerosis. So that's ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Exactly. So a lot of the motor symptoms that we see in CTE, you know, I didn't mention this before, but you know, there's also a subset of CTE cases that. Um, have this TDP 43 buildup and that right. is connected to the motor symptoms that we see in boxers um, right because it, causes, it causes death of motor neurons so your nerves that run to your muscles and tell your muscles to move those neurons die when TDP clumps up exactly and we'll see some cerebellar scarring and, and things like that which are associated we associate with the TB, TDP 43 buildup and we we don't really see that a lot in the football players. Um, they haven't seen mm. it a lot, which is interesting. You know, it's connected more to the boxers because they have this twisting of the head within the spine is probably getting a lot of damage. Exactly, and and if you think about it, you know, you, all of the nerve paths are running through the spine, right? And if you're twisting yep. the brainstem, you're going to be causing some damage in some of these axons and you know the projections. So that could be one of the reasons why we see some of these motor symptoms you know, in the CTE and boxers. <clears throat> yeah, that's actually really fascinating. So it brings me back to one story uh, my PI told me in like a journal club, I think, years ago, in that there was this one, I think it, it was an Italian team of soccer players, and they all started coming down with ALS-like symptoms. So amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, it's like super fast progressive disease where once TDP starts clumping up, it just annihilates your motor neurons. It's really a death sentence even today, um, which is really sad is that we haven't found out any ways to stop the disease entirely. We can slow it a little bit with treatment, but... It's brutal, um, yeah. Yeah, This was, um, it, I hate to cut you off, but this was um, what Stephen Hawking had, correct? And yes. who else? He lasted a really long time, honestly. He, did he was really like well. a, an outlier. And then this was exactly. the ice, the, what was it? The ice bucket challenge was related to this. So if you did exactly, the ice bucket yeah. challenge, you did it for ALS, which is good because it's a brutal disease, like Connor was saying. Yeah, and, and my lab works on ALS as well. So we're super interested in the mechanism of that. But going back to this Italian team of soccer players, um, they were wondering why they were coming down with like these ALS-like symptoms. And it was because they had, like all, a lot of soccer players will head the ball, right? So the ball mm. is flying up in the air because someone kicked it. And then they hit it with their head to maybe knock it into the goal or knock it over another player. Um, and it's like, it's thought to be a really fun move. It's very stylish. But 
you can imagine a soccer ball coming down from 50 feet up in the air and then you're trying to bounce it back up another 30 feet in the air. That's a lot of force. And mm-hmm. that comes down right on your spine. These players came down with ALS-like symptoms. They were they thought because they were just using their heads to move the ball around so much more than any other team. <laughs> yeah, and that makes sense. I think I actually heard about this. Mm-hmm. Um, and not to mention, soccer players also get injuries from each other. You know, they run into each other. They get kicked right. in the head. You know, this is these accidents happen. And actually, there was one study that I read when i was doing a lot of this research was and they stated they followed a group of female soccer players over the course of four years female college soccer players right and they did this was an mri study so they did an mri i don't remember how many times each year but every year they did x amount of mris and over the course of the course of four years they kind of wanted to measure what happens during four years of playing collegiate soccer right mm-hmm and without find, you know, they didn't find a lot, but what they did found was that the brain, the overall brain size shrunk a little bit. Wow. Which is crazy. Now and it, that and they're from comparing, all the binge drinking in college? Or? <laughs> <laughs> but not really. I mean, compared to the controls, the brain was growing. You know, like what they were saying is that this is crazy because in a period of time where your brain normally is gaining mass, mm-hmm. they were losing mass, you know, That's and scary. whether... You know, and some of them had, you know, concussions and things like that during the seasons, and this is normal, you know. But mm-hmm. just the fact that they measured a marked, you know, decrease in brain size was kind of crazy. You know? But yeah, obviously, yeah, this is just a preliminary study, and, you know, it's, it's not one all be all, you know. So, so we can't stop playing these sports, right? Or at least some of us can't. <laughs> well, I think... Certainly- you know, for me, here's the thing. I, I'm all for sports. I've done my fair share of sports. I think you need to, what, what there really needs to be and what I'm trying to work towards is to come up with like a clinical diagnosis or a risk factor. You know, if you have X amount of concussions and we marked that your GFAP levels were X, you know, to come up with a clinical limit and to say, look, you need to stop. You know, you need to mm-hmm. stop playing sports. You have a risk. You, you know, had two concussions the past couple of years. We're kind of worried about you. You should probably stop playing contact sports, you know, and probably start doing things that promote neurogenesis, blah, 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 blah. And to try to, you know, I think that's what we need to do. And the biggest problem now is that the sub-concussive blows are actually related to this, you know. So you don't even need to have a concussion. Mm. And, you know, how many football players do you know you know if they get hit and they didn't get concussed they want to go back in and play you know they're not going to say you know the co- if the coach says are you okay you okay like you sure you're ready to go back in he'll be like hell yeah <laughs> like what are you talking about yeah you, know, you these, don't want to stop playing you're nobody wants play. to stop playing exactly so the problem you know there needs to be some sort of numbers and co- we need to quantify the risk factors see what i'm saying to mm-hmm. say look you've had you know, you played two seasons, and we see a high level of GFAP in your blood. We sh- you should probably take a season off, or you know, we need to figure out a clinically how we can measure the the amount of damage, and then we need to come up with some sort of guidelines. You know, to say, look, stop playing, or keep playing, or you're fine, or you know what I mean. I think this mm-hmm. is the future. This might also help you understand. How, why some people are more resistant to it or protected yeah, from exactly. it. And then maybe they're doing something right that other people can adopt those strategies. Yeah, exactly. So I think this is the next step. Um, another thing, I th- from my understanding, I've read a couple papers that were exploring APOE4 gene, which I'm sure you know a lot about. Yep, which is major to Alzheimer's. gene yeah. in Alzheimer's, yeah. And some studies said, yeah, it's connected. Other studies said, no. So it's kind of, I think more studies need to be done on that to figure out, is it actually a risk factor for CTE as well? So it's oh, something. Cool. And then genetic testing, I think. I mean, that's the future, genetic testing. If you have APOE4 and it's connected to this CTE, then probably don't go and become a professional boxer, you know? <laughs> so so uh, everything multiplies your risk, right? Uh, I know in Alzheimer's disease, it, when you can have something that's like a, three times increased risk now your base level for alzheimer's disease is 
fairly low. It's reasonably low. But if you multiply it by three, it gets bigger. And then if you get a hand injury, maybe that multiplies it even more. So yeah, that's what you're talking about, right? We don't want to have someone who's already vulnerable do something that increases their risk. Yeah. Well, and, and this is different than Alzheimer's because usually you are playing a contact sport that is directly correlated with your acquisition of this disease, right? So if we can stop them from playing at an early age when we know that they have a risk, then I think that's that's where this that's where the importance is in this. Mm-hmm. But it's actually, you know, I wanted to bring up one other point before we we finish this up is that the most complicating thing is the use of, you know, okay, so all this information, a lot of the problems that CTE you know, clinical issues and symptoms that people have been having with CTE are connected to neurobehavioral changes, right? Like depression, um, emotional instability, aggressiveness, or they're really impulsive and irritable. A Mm. lot of these, you know, it's something that's not really been explored is, you know, the lifestyle of these people and the comorbid use of, for example, steroids is huge, I think. So you go to the uh, NFL, you have a huge, you know, a lot of people are taking steroids. It's just a fact, you know, and a lot of these big sports, people are taking steroids and that's fine. I and I, that's a whole nother conversation. You know, I don't want <laughs> steroids yeah. is a whole nother, you know, performance enhancing drugs. That's a whole nother podcast. But, but what they do is alter it, hormone levels later. Exactly. In life, right? So the question is, look, you're severely depressed and you have emotional instability. Are we connecting this to CTE? Or is it connected to the fact that you did steroids for four years and now you're in a low testosterone state and your body's trying to recover and, you know what I mean, get a new baseline? And so it's just, and you're just depressed and you don't feel good and you're unstable. Yeah, let's, let's break that down for people real quick. Not everyone may know the dangers of steroids, right? Um, so if you're taking steroids like early in life, or I think most people probably do it in their 20s, um, around our age, they want to get big and like impress people. So steroids basically up the level of testosterone in a male, at least. I'm not sure what they would do in females. Um, yeah, the same, testosterone is You want the testosterone male sex... as a female, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, testosterone is typically known as the male sex hormone. It increases muscle density, I believe bone density. It just makes you bigger, stronger, um, and it, it does a lot of things in the brain as well. Yeah. So it's naturally produced at high levels uh, in a young adult. And it's typically thought to decline even in healthy males. But if you're supplementing a lot of testosterone when you're young, your body gets desensitized to it and it thinks, oh, I, I'm getting all this free testosterone from somewhere. I should probably stop making so much or I don't need to put so many resources into making it. So you make less and then your body gets used to that. And then if you get off the steroids, then presumably your body can't re Uh, ramp up the testosterone production so later in life you lose all of this production and that's when people get depressed because it's also Mm -hmm. very important in the brain like i said well it takes time you know it takes a long time because if you imagine taking it for four years and then you stop taking it yep you know it's going to take probably at least another four years to get your normal baselines that you had before you know it's it's not like just two days later your body's like okay it's time to start producing again no it's it's going to take a long time to get back to a homeostasis state, right? I have heard that it never catches up, but yeah, I, and that's I'm another thing. You know, that. I think they need to. You know, that's a whole another topic that we could, we should definitely talk about. Um, but yeah, of course, it's connected to happiness, how you feel, you know, aggress, aggression, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I think something you know that's confusing the statistics in CTE is that one thing is steroids. And not to mention other drugs, you know what I mean? Who knows? Um, antidepressants, a- anti-anxiety drugs, um, painkillers. Another one, huge one, is painkillers, and in, in mm-hmm. especially in football players, um, alcohol. I mean, you alcohol. Name it, sure. Yeah, but I think the, the biggest ones for me, I think, are steroids and like painkillers and or antidepressant, antidepressives. What is it? Antidepressants. Oh. <laughs> antidepressants. Yeah. yeah. Antidepressants. <laughs> <laughs> I lost. <laughs> Um, I think those are the biggest ones for me because those are, you know, when you stop taking them or when you even start to take them, sometimes they have adverse effects, you know. So that's mm. confusing and making the water a little, bur- little more murky, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to, to, you know, to say, look, you have brain damage, you have CTE, and you're depressed. Is the depression related to CTE or is it related to other things in your life? You know, it's it's right. complicated. 
So that's something they need to kind of do a little bit more work on, I think, in my, in my opinion. Um, what else? But yeah, there's a lot of really cool research coming out every day, it seems like, in CTE. Um, the, I think the most important thing, I think it's almost more important to be able to do an in vivo early diagnosis of CTE than to test Alzheimer's. It in yeah. Super because early. in Alzheimer's, it's kind of, you have it and, you know, what, what can we do? You know, that sucks. But in CTE, at least we can say, hey, stop playing football or just quit boxing. You know, at least we can prevent further damage and hope that, you know, things improve a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important, especially for younger kids, too. I mean, you know, some of these studies I was reading were ridiculous. I yeah, had one right for you now. Um, <clears throat> anyway, while I'm looking for it, do you have any more questions about, about CTE, pathology? Clinical uh, I do want to, I guess, ask, kind of looping back to something you said about neck strength. Uh, I, we, we love to always ask in our interviews, right? <laughs> Has the research that you've been doing changed your <laughs> viewpoint of life in any way? Uh, do you think about working out your neck? And if so, like, how do you do that? I mean, I know you're not taking blows to the head or anything like that. Um, but sometimes you, know, you knock heads with someone in jujitsu or, any, or some stuff like that. Uh, do you think about that? Uh, when you're doing sports or yeah i mean and if you look at all the ex like the pro boxers they're all doing neck muscles because they don't want to get knocked out this is not a secret in the boxing world um you know mike tyson mm -hmm. had a huge neck. it almost like he didn't have a neck you know <laughs> because it's it was like so strong into yeah. his shoulders yeah and you know traps too is another muscle that can help absorb this but i mean not really i'm not in in these contact sports situations anymore recently i've been kind of just doing you know triathlon type training and stuff like that so so no actually but i mean if if you are in any of these i would urge any people that are playing contact sports to work their neck muscles out i mean it, it can't hurt you know it's good, just gonna absorb some of the the impact and help you out help your brain out weird but that's worth it but that's worth it i mean you know and there's i'm sure you can find on the internet plenty different just look up boxing neck muscle workout and, and you'll find a bunch of those um, yeah, anyway, so I found the study I was going to tell you about that. Do, 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 where was it? This was crazy. So they, they measured, they wore these special masks. Or not masks, mm -hmm. what am I talking about? They wore special helmets? helmets. Yeah, helmets. And they put 10 football players during a season, and they wore a special helmet with a sensor in it, right? And they found out that the number of total head impacts per season ranged between 400 and almost 2,000 in an individual athlete so, so that, that could be any impact though right it could be like that's just like it like... i think it's like they had a threshold you know i, I can't tell you the threshold of um, of the impact but i just know sure, that 2000 is a lot you know <laughs> of course it yep. depends on what <laughs> what position you play um i think what wide receivers or i mean it just depends depends what you're playing mm -hmm. um, but still anyway that was i just wanted to spit out those numbers because i thought they were surprising mm -hmm. so we're <laughs> sports then i guess if we're if we're going by that boxing would be at the top uh football well, after that or i i don't even know i mean it, the the problem the difference between boxing and you're gonna get weaker blows but a higher amount of blows in football you might get some 300 pound guy running at you full speed you know and just mm -hmm. deck you so <laughs> this is not something yeah. you see in <laughs> in boxing so i think you're going to get less blows uh, in football but you're going to sometimes get some severe you know high impact blows from linemen or something someone coming at you full speed mm -hmm. um so you know that's just from my understanding i would be worried i mean but i love those both sports you know i can't say stop playing these sports because i i'm a huge well, a lot of um, what they've been talking about, I think in both sports, actually, or I know this is a conversation that's happened in the UFC, which uh, is not exactly boxing. It's boxing plus wrestling, basically, for those who don't know. It's like that cage fighting you might have seen on TV. But they've thought about ditching the gloves because in, uh, in previous times, like I think probably centuries ago by this point, people used to just bare knuckle box, and it looked really bad. Everyone was bloodied because there were no pads on the gloves. 
um, you know, that their knuckles would bleed, their faces would bleed, because it's basically just bone on bone at that point. But what they think is that that actually limits the amount of blows that you can deliver to someone's head, so the fights are much shorter, and you may not actually get as much traumatic brain injury. The same thing happens in football, where the helmets, they think, allow people to run at each other and breakneck speed, whereas you don't see, I don't think you see this kind of stuff with rugby where people aren't wearing helmets, right? You get a, t you get a ton of other injuries in rugby, but <laughs> I don't know about the head injuries. Uh, you're, you're definitely still getting the head injuries in rugby. Um, there have, like I had seen a couple studies in rugby players and MMA fighters, um, but not to the extent of, of boxing and football players. Just mm -hmm. maybe it's because of where the money's at and, you know, who's doing They're the studies. They're more common sports, exactly. boxing, and football than MMA. But rugby. definitely rugby, they get smacked. But that's that's an interesting point. You know, and I don't think that will just solve the problem. You know, say so take sure. the gloves off yeah. and, you know, you're not going to get head injury because you're still going to get head injury. <laughs> Especially, yeah. you know, the, I think. Still hitting each other. MMA is almost worse than, you know, MMA is one of my favorite sports to watch. I, I'll be honest. But. I think it's almost worse than boxing because you get the elbows and the knees and the kicks mm -hmm. to the head. And those are bone on bone and you can produce a lot more power from a leg or a knee you can with a, with a hand. Right. And potentially so, like some submissions are choking the other person out. So imagine you hit this person in the head a bunch and their, you know, their brain is trying to recover and then you pass them out by restricting oxygen flow. To their brain. <laughs> I don't think that's good. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's a good way exactly. to recover. No, it's not. It's going to cause more. Than, and that's a whole other thing I would love to get into. Uh, you know, it's cutting blood flow to the brain in jujitsu is something I thought about a lot. Cause I, mm -hmm. I mean, me and you have been, I've been doing jujitsu since I was 18. A long yep. time. And, yep, yeah, you know, just after learning neuroscience, you know, I start to, started to think like, whoa, I don't, you know, what happens when you cut the blood flow to the brain? You know, you see cell yep. death you know necrosis and this is just something that happens <laughs> so that's why your brain shuts off if you get yeah. choked out for too long because it realizes it doesn't have the fuel it says all right we need to conserve yeah and to prevent you know more necrosis from happening so anyway these you know i'd love to see that's what you know this is this is one of the reasons why i love research on neurogenesis too because it's kind of just repairing the brain you know you've been through some wars but you want to repair you know so what can you do to do that um so yeah that's you know i think the future will be in vivo diagnosis some guidelines to say hey you should probably stop and then ideally some sort of you know neurogenesis plan that can help you to regenerate the damage you've done throughout life or throughout whatever you know high impact or high risk sports you've been doing yeah it's also actually military was another big one you know a lot of blast impacts oh, right. there's a lot of yeah. studies on that it's been in the news and a lot of vets especially from the iraq and afghanistan war theaters have been killing themselves from depression and uh, when you look at their brains they're deficient in a lot of the hormones that keep us balanced every day right exactly well this was one thing i did not get into when was was that was uh, military yeah, exactly and the suicide rate and they're way the higher whole, than other wars well the whole reason is that the whole reason why ct research begun was i think in my opinion was you know cte and tbi has been studied for many years but it really got you know came the limelight after a couple nfl players committed suicide right and that's when you know the news really said look you know famous rich happy nfl player killed himself and then you're like why what happened and then they're like oh it's brain damage then they start to put a lot of money into it and you know then the you know have you seen the movie concussion nope well you need to watch that this is oof, everybody that's out. listening needs to watch this movie called concussion concussion it basically oh. explains this whole story, you know, the fight between NFL and actually Will Smith, I think, is the main actor. It's an mm -hmm. excellent movie. Uh, he's an investigator. I don't want to spoil too much, but he, you know, does a lot of postmortem studies on some of these NFL players. And he finds Tao all of a sudden. He's like, well, this is a disease. And then the NFL fights him. And it's just an excellent movie. You need to watch it. So, yeah, it's all based on a true story then. Yeah, this is all a true story. This is based on uh, one of the top 
researchers who is Bennett Amalu. Actually, if you're interested in this, this is the guy mm -hmm. that, you know, this is the guy to follow. He's, he's, I think he's based in Boston. Boston is one of the top, um, areas for this type of research. So anyway, Bennett Amalu, he's like the top dog in, in the field. So hmm. anyway, yeah, this movie I believe is based on him. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but the movie is excellent. You should watch it. I mean, even for people that you know, are not scientifically based, you still need to watch it. It's just, it's just an excellent movie. Sweet. Yeah. I'll check it out. It's just called concussion. You know, that's it. So yeah, nice. Connor, um, I'm running out of things to tell you. We're definitely going to do a part two. I have a lot more to tell you actually, but I'm going to save it. So <laughs> you're kind of writing the book on this, right? I'm trying so. to, um, you know, it's one of my main interests, me, you know, having a physiology and exercise science background and then going into neuroscience. This has been, you know, it's literally the perfect thing for me to get into, you know, brain damage, sports. Um, you know, I love working with athletes. So this is something I'm, I'm pushing for. So I'm doing a lot of reading and research. And staying up to date so so yeah we, we're gonna do a part two in the next you know maybe month or so and with you know more information so keep an eye out for that all nice that's it. um yeah i don't have any more questions for you i think this is really good field to keep advancing because uh, like you said we're seeing a lot of athletes and soldiers come down with us yeah, and I think the best part is that, you know, early diagnosis can lead to, you know, changes, you know, lifestyle changes that prevent further damage, you know, where something that's really important, you know, CT is really important to stop doing what you're doing that's causing the damage as soon as possible, you know. So, I mean, is it essentially just stop uh, playing those sports or are there other things people can do? Oof, like, I mean, <laughs> probably eat, uh, you know, good diet and first step. Yeah. The right course. type of exercise. As long as it's not traumatic exercise, you know, neurogenesis is a whole nother thing that we should talk about, you know, or just mm -hmm. or lifestyle changes to have a healthy brain. You know, we should do a whole podcast on that. Oh, definitely. So, so yeah, that's about it. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Uh, it's been a pleasure, and look forward to telling you guys a little bit more about thing and next next step in this in this field. So, yeah, shoot us any questions that arose from you listening to this, and we can address them in the second part. Sweet. Well, thanks for tuning in. Bye. Right, take care, folks. Yep. Thanks, all. Three, two, one. Stop. <laughs>